وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما لم تنا وزدنا علما إن شاء الله استعد سون استفكس الحمد لله نعم بارك الله فيكم وجزاك الله خيرا for joining us for another episode of our seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walhamdulillah inshallah we're continuing today al-fiqh of seerah Shaykh Muhammad Ghazali now just gonna wait for a few seconds for everyone to join inshallah Um, we were left last time on which page, mashallah? Which page are we on? We talked about Al Isra al Miraj. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Sixty-three. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. So we talked about al Isra wal Miraj. Alhamdulillah. And now we're continuing the differences between the two towns, the Mass Hijra, its causes and its effects. Now, so the Mass Hijra, obviously, this is now. The Hijra of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Medina. This is the mass Hijra with all the people, pretty much, except for the Prophet Sallam Ali radiallahu an and Abu Bakr undertook. Okay, and this is just the condition was becoming unbearable in Mecca. The conditions in Mecca were becoming unbearable. So finally, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave permission to the believers to migrate. They did not migrate for such a long time. Question is why? Why did they not migrate before? Why did Allah allow them to go through this difficulty in life? And the, question, the answer is because they had to. They had to build resilience. They had to build skills to be able to deal with what was coming. What was coming in Medina, in the battles, in the Muslim Ummah. This was something that we had to, had to go through as an Ummah. And today we live in a society where many people shy away from difficulties and hardships because you know, comfort is very, very, very easy. Comfort is very easy. But there's no growth in comfort. Humans gravitate towards comfort. But there is no growth in comfort. And the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba were put by Allah to be in less comfortable situation. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, we as an ummah, we're doing a disservice to our children, to our brothers and sisters, because we're always looking for comfort. Look, look at the parent. A parent will always try to take the most comfortable situation for their children, isn't it? Whatever they can do in terms of comfort, they'll do it for them, to the point that it leads to what we call spoiling. They get spoiled. And that destroys the child. We are suffering. Our children are playing games online. Our children don't want to move. They're overweight. They're just not healthy. 
because we are making a big mistake to just always make sure that we give them the greatest comfort possible that they have. And then we wonder why we are suffering or having problems. It's, I don't know. I mean, it's like obvious. So, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba were put through some very, very difficult situations and it helped them. It helped them build who they are now. So, the idolaters of Mecca, they squeezed the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. We know that there was delegations that came from Yathrib to Mecca during the pilgrimage season. And this is where they met with the Prophet Wasallam, and they, the Pledge of Aqaba. This is where they invited the Prophet Wasallam to come to Medina to solve some of the problems, which were what? Was there was some civil strife in between the two tribes, Al-Awz and Khazraj. And obviously the Jews of Medina also were there causing issues. These were social problems. These were business problems. There was a lot of instability in what at that time was called Yathrib. Now, at that time, it was called Yathrib. So, the Jews would always interfere as well. So they would say, for example, God is about to send us a prophet who we shall follow and we shall help him to destroy you. They used to tease the Arabs like that. Okay? And he says, as Ad and Iram were destroyed. Iram Adatil, right? Umud. Al Am wa Tamud wa Iram, which were, some scholars say, Arab tribes. So the Jews are saying, we're going to do the same thing as God destroyed your forefathers. Right? So, but of course that was a, um, that was a whole huge rude awakening, a rude awakening. So on the other hand, the Arabs who were threatened with this coming opened their hearts to the Prophet Of course, when the pilgrimage seasons approached, and the tribes of Yathrib arrived in Mecca. They saw the Prophet inviting people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of them said, Oh people, by God, you know that this is the one whom the Jews threaten you with. So do not let them to precede you in belief. Look at that. I want to make a point here. The point is that the Jews were describing the Prophet so well that the, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, the Arabs, would recognize him. You understand? So when they reached Mecca and they saw the Prophet and they saw him, they heard him speak. They said, whoa, that's him. This is the one that the Jews told us about. So do not for one second allow them to beat you to believe in him. Let us go forward and believe first. And that is a huge thing that happened, actually. And they did. So the talk of Islam began to spread gradually in Medina. And all those not given a warm welcome, of course, because people are, you know, it's like when it's something is new, when something is new, brothers and sisters, people are not comfortable. I, it doesn't matter, even if it's a political change in the country, and even if it's for the best, People don't like change. People don't welcome change for the same reasons I just mentioned about five minutes ago. That they, it is uncomfortable. Change is uncomfortable. It takes effort, time. Losing weight takes effort. Having more barak and more productivity means losing sleep. It's not comfortable. People don't like it. That's why they stay where they are. It's for those who are able to overcome this, this gravity that pulls them towards the earth to sit where they are and do nothing, then they get ahead. As for the ones who don't, who just prefer comfort, then they will not move forward. Some people didn't welcome it. 
obviously the people were very worried because now people are saying, hey, maybe Muhammad وسلم, will be the, the solution to our problems. The solution to our problems. So, what were the differences between the two towns? There's, there's differences. So you have Mecca, Medina, you have, um, well, it was not Medina, it was Yathrib, and you have, um, right, so those are like the main cities, right? Mecca, uh, Medina, and you have Taif as well. Taif is also, or what, in that area, was one of the big cities. If you notice, there is no mention throughout the Quran of the city port of Jeddah. And Jeddah, if you know, is not that far from Mecca. About by car, about one hour. By camel, mm, yeah, I mean, I don't know, depends. But it's not far. We don't see in the Quran any mention of any other cities like Jeddah or anything. Uh, mentions of Yemen, direct, indirectly, Sham. However, no other cities. So anyway, the difference between Mecca and Yathrib. Mecca had a life of ease and tranquility for a long time because people would come there to make their Hajj, their pilgrimage. And that is to honor the Sha'ar or the habits or practices of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so they had the, the, you know, the sanctuary and also the skills to trade. But one would lead to the other because everyone's coming to perform Hajj. Everyone then is coming to one place. So hence they can use it as a business. Um, till today, there's nothing wrong actually with business in Hajj. There's many things that are haram while you're in Hajj, such as being with your wife, marrying, hunting, cutting nails, grooming, all these things, perfuming, but not buying and selling. It is allowed. And you'll be thinking like, wait a second, why would Allah allow this one and not that one? Why can I not cut my nails? It doesn't make sense. But I can sell something and make money. Oh, it's so dunya, dunya, dunya we. It's not. That's the whole point. Because there's such a, you can cut your nails anytime. But you cannot sell or buy or sell or meet other people anytime. You see, you need to put things in perspective. People sometimes judge Islam in the wrong sense. No, Islam is practical. Islam is about life, real life situation. So it's perfect. It's perfect. So, uh, of course, the Quraysh were overtaken by greed, pride. They were hard-hearted. They're inflexible. So when Islam appeared and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi called people towards the truth, then of course they rejected him and those who followed him because they were stubborn. And stubbornness, that they were, it was from first day, and it would it would uh, compromise their position. What do you mean there's only one God? It means all these other gods that people are coming to visit are not good. Uh, equals to minus dollar signs or whatever, you know, dirham signs, right? No, that, that's exactly right what they were fearing. They could care less about the truth. What they wanted is, they wanted to make sure that uh, they make money. So yes, it is halal to trade and hajj and to make money, but it's not halal to be greedy and to deny the truth because of money or to sell your faith and your akhirah for money. Okay? Very clear. It's a big and a fine line and distinction between making money with Islam, which is halal. Make as much money as you want. Bismillah. Give me some as well <laughs> if you're on the way. And same with me. Right? Do it. Bismillah. Good. The sky is the limit. Become, I don't become the wealthiest person in this ummah. Bismillah. But don't let it settle for one second in your heart or to compromise your principles 
and your beliefs because of that. Okay? Don't let it be even for one second. No. <clears throat> However, the Prophet ﷺ, he tried very hard to convince the people of Mecca that their acceptance of the truth would not deprive them one iota of the benefits that they were enjoying. Okay? Nevertheless, they just stuck to this belief. So the Prophet was not there to like take their money away. And actually, if people would have accepted the truth, that would be nice talking. If people would have accepted the truth, like khalas, Hajj would continue till today. You know what happens in Hajj and Umrah and every single day in Mecca. People are buying and selling. Just outside of the Masjid, you go into the hotels, every place has a store. Every place has some store, right? So there's always going to be business in Mecca. Always. Mecca, Medina, always business. Now, so the, the, because of that, the threat, the leaders of Mecca were at war with Islam and they're considering that we were defending our material goods and our economic well-being. And of course, that's not what it was. As for the condition of Yathrib, they were the opposite. Deep-rooted enmity between its people had drained their blood, destroyed their unity and made them preoccupied with one another. There's wars, feuds, feuds that people even forgot about what they were fighting for. And the kids would be inheriting this hatred, right? It's very, very difficult to understand, but you know, people will inherit these negative things. Their parents talk negative all the time and hate someone and keep saying, you know, this person like this, this person like that. The kids are going to pick it up, subhanAllah. The kids are going to pick it up. Now, okay, the Jews' handiwork. The Jews who had settled in Medina. Um, why did the Jews settle in Medina? So the scholars said because they were waiting for the Prophet ﷺ. But they thought it was going to be from amongst the Jews. So they settled in Medina and um, they fled you know, different parts of the Arabian Peninsula from the persecution of Christians who had long tried to Christianize or exterminate them. So the Jews were trying to escape Christianity. The reason for this was the Jewish attitude towards Jesus and his mother and you know that they believed that the, and the Christians believe that the Jews crucified uh, Jesus. Okay, so there is a, a deep rooted enmity between the Jews and the Christians specifically that they you know how they view Jesus and Mary as you know it's not like they view them as we do as a prophet and a woman who is the mother of the Prophet, who is one of the best women, but the Jews viewed them as the Asa Mustafa as a bastard, Mustafa meaning he came out of wedlock, and Maryam salam. and Allah says in the Quran that your mother was not a illicit woman, like basically insulting her, Mustafa while we love Jesus and Mary, peace be upon both of them. You see the extremes though, so the Jews say very bad things, or they believe very bad things about Jesus. But look how the Christians have become like their slaves these days, you know, in America and all over. They are like the slaves of Jews, of the Zionist movement. So, but they're very smart in what they do and how they do it, that's why. Now, and in doing so, the Jews though are very smart, you know. Till today, they control the financial sector. Back then, they controlled the financial center. It was all about that because, well, it's as the saying goes, it's the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Very simple. And they have the gold. They control diamonds, gold, the greatest, um, the greatest empire, financial empires with the Rockefellers and others who are Zionists, Jews, whether they believe in God or not, for them it's become a philosophy of world domination. Very simple. 
they believe that they are entitled. All right, so keep that in mind. So they were basically holding down the financial strength. In the Arabian Peninsula, they were a minority and they didn't want to clash openly with the Arabs. So they were basically sowing enmity between, they were sowing enmity between kith and kin, between the Awz and the Khazraj. They would say things, they would start fights. So the two Arab tribes would fight each other and the Jewish tribe would be inciting them or sowing enmity from the back. Now, a few years before the Hijrah of the Prophet there was a huge battle, a ferocious battle between Buath, the battle of Buath, sorry, between Auz and Khazraj. And the Khazraj had the upper hand and the tables were turned and victory favored the Auz. Both parties were on the verge of annihilating each other when sensible people intervened and advised them to live and let live. For it was better to be neighbors of brothers rather than neighbors of foxes, i.e. the Jews. So this tribulation made the people of Medina look to Islam. Yeah, there was circumstance, like they were suffering. So some smart people said, hey, look, come on, you guys can't see that this is what's happening? Let's not do this. Let's put things aside because these people are messing us up. And that is why I open their hearts to the Quran and to the Prophet Sallallahu and to, to Islam. Ibn Ishaq reported that when Allah wished to make his religious victorious, strengthen his Prophet Sallallahu and fulfill his promise to him, the Messenger of Allah went forth in the pilgrimage season where he met a group of people from Medina, from Yathrib, he introduced himself to the Arab tribes as he would do to every pilgrim or in every pilgrimage. And while he was at Al Aqaba, he met a group of pilgrims from the Khazraj tribe, whom Allah wished to benefit. And Asim ibn Umar ibn Qatada spoke to me of what the elders of his tribe said. When the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said to them, Who are you? They replied, A group of Khazraj. He said, Clients of the Jews? He said, Yes. Clients of the Jews, as in like they were having some relationship with the Jews, business and so on. He said, Won't you sit down and let me talk to you? They agreed and sat down and he then invited them to Allah, explain Islam, recite the Quran. We see here a different da'wah dynamics versus what we have today. People today find all kind of excuses for not to do da'wah because they say, well, you know, it's not so good. We don't want to upset anyone. Well, he was pretty much, the Prophet was, was you can say he was risking burning any bridge with a possible great connection for the future. But did he say, oh, let me just tell them a little bit about like how I think we can solve their problems with the internal strife. No, he called them to Allah. Why? Because Islam is the solution. The solution is not our personal opinions. Islam is the solution. Bismillah. Islam is a social. So the Prophet ﷺ sat down, told them, invited them to Allah. Asim continued saying, they responded to his call by believing in him. They believed. Look at that. One sitting. And they accepted what he offered to them of Islam. The thing is with the Arabs, the Arabs were very simple. They were stubborn, but they were simple. And they understood that, you know, it's, um, it's life changing. Like this will be a solution for them. You know, Arabs follow tribal leaders. Arabs have a lot of respect for leaders. Um, sometimes they are not very uh, disciplined when it comes to 
systems and policies, but they have allegiance. They have the strength of allegiance to their tribe leaders. And you can say the greatest, um, the greatest system, the greatest discipline that was brought in the world of the Arabs, in the history of Arabs, is Islam. No doubt about it. No doubt. Before them, they were lost. They didn't have any system. They had good qualities of chivalry and bashfulness and, and, and some, some did. But um, the Islam was the system that really, really made it clear and it was the best. So, the people said, the people from Yathrib said, we left our people behind with so much enmity and evil amongst them. Perhaps Allah will unite them through you. We shall return to them and invite them to your affair. We shall explain to them this faith which we have accepted from you. If Allah unites them under you, then there will be no man dearer to us than you. SubhanAllah. Then they returned to their countries having believed and trusted. <clears throat> the small group was the vanguard of a successful campaign for Islam in Yathrib. Their efforts bore fruits rapidly and there remained not a single home which Islam did not enter. When the year elapsed and the season of pilgrimage came around again, so this is a long time and one year, people think that, okay, it just happened yesterday, tomorrow, no. It's like it took time for things to happen. I told you, right? 23 years is not a joke. A long time, 13 years in Mecca, 10 in Medina, is not an easy task. Time took for things to happen. So, some people, obviously the next year, they came back to the Prophet wasallam. Some of them were from the previous group last year, and most of them were new. And it was about, Allah knows best how many, but uh, and it, was a, it was a bigger group. It was a bigger group. So the first pledge of Aqaba, this is where they actually sorry, take a pledge from him. So before he spoke to them, now they take a pledge. The Apostle said, met them in Aqaba and took from them a pledge to believe in Allah alone. Practice all virtues and keep away from all vices. Ubadah ibn Samit said one night, on the night of the first pledge of Aqaba, we pledge to the message of Allah that we will not associate any partners with Allah, we will not steal, we will not commit adultery, we will not kill our children, we will not make false accusation before our hands and feet, and we will not disobey Him in what was right. The Prophet said, they said if you fulfill this, you will have Jannah, you will enter paradise. However, if you omit any of it and you are punished for it in this world, it is an atonement for you. Look at that, subhanAllah. If you conceal it till the day of judgment, then your matter will be left with Allah to decide. If He wills, He will punish you, otherwise He will forgive you. So He's teaching them Aqeedah. So He's saying, hey, promise to me you won't steal, you won't cheat, you won't do this, this, this. If somehow it happens that Allah might punish you in this life, if you can conceal it, then Allah might punish you or might forgive you on the Day of Judgment. It's teaching them Aqeedah. Now, so you can see how attractive that was in a society that was destructive, right? So the Prophet was demanding this and this was what Jahiliyyah was objecting to. So the Prophet is calling to fairness, to righteousness, and Jahiliyyah, the Quraysh, is saying, no, we don't want that. Anyway, the delegation from Yathrib completed their pledge and headed back home. The Prophet thought it was best to send amongst with them one trusted man who would oversee the growth of Islam in this new area to teach the Quran and to give them an insight into the deen, to the knowledge of the deen. So he, cho he chose Musab ibn Omer, Musab bin Omer, Musab bin Omer, who was to be their faithful teacher. Musab met with the great success in the propagation of Islam amongst the people. So he was the, like the missionary guy that the Prophet sent at that time. 
Now, <clears throat> so he encouraged people to stay away from bad things, to work, you know, towards righteousness and goodness, to pray. So there's many things, many changes in the family systems, traditions that he advised them. And Alhamdulillah, uh, he was very, very successful. Do not suppose that Musab um, was like those mercenary missionaries whom Western imperialism trusts before itself as it marches on the east. You may see one of them crouching beside a bed of a sick man saying to him, this glass the virgin is offering you and this love Christ is presenting to you, right? So they're trying to trick people. They do that. They do that. Or perhaps one of them will open a school with education as a apparent aim or a refuge with the sole purpose of charity. Um, then he will direct the entrance to the goal he has in mind to, tra to transform the change to Christianity. And it's a big thing. Um, it's, a, it's a form of spiritual dishonesty, as the Sheikh calls it, which hides behind the title of missionary work, and those who represent this mockery find the courage to do their work from the states which send them. So if, they, if, if you see them determined and persevere, do not forget the power that supports them on land and in sea and in the air. Indeed, it is so true. They get paid so well. They have everything. They have, they're pushed, they're trained. So of course, when you have, imagine, the kind of zeal that you work with, if you know that, um, that you're working for a good amount of money and belonging to a group and realizing things, you have a mission even. Because a lot of people don't know what's right and what's wrong. They, they just, um, you know, they're just, they don't know, they're oblivious. So, this doesn't happen with the Muslims. We are struggling to get some money here and there, to get some projects, to unite. It just doesn't work, right? The Muslims don't do that. We don't invest money into missionary work. Very little. Alhamdulillah, there is some, no doubt. But cannot be compared for one minute to how the Western missionaries work. Cannot, cannot, millions. Campus Crusaders, um, all the other Amer Aramaic Broadcasting Network, uh, you name it, you name it. Big organizations, big budgets, a lot of missionaries, very determined. So we see the Christians sometimes, why are they so committed to their faith? Look how committed they are. And you're just like, yeah, there's a lot behind. I'm not saying it's just about money. Even the fact that they believe they're on the truth, they have a direction. They are, you can say, motivated, right? It's a very, very big thing. Now, they open schools. I've seen the missionaries in Africa. I've seen the missionaries in Arab countries. I've seen the missionaries in, um, in America and Canada targeting mosques and targeting the Muslims there. And yes, with a lot of success many times. A lot of success. Now, on the other hand, Musab was sent by a persecuted prophet whose message condemned the existing laws and who had no material attractions to offer. So compare that to this. The Prophet ﷺ sending Musab bin Umair, not with money and missionary work like backed up by a huge budget, with the Quran and the Sunnah with the Quran soon. So, what, but however, what Musab had, what Musab had, it was the sincerity that Allah given him. The astuteness. And this was a sacrifice. He sacrificed everything for his faith. And that is when Allah SWT brings about the the barakah when someone gives and sacrifices their time their living their dying in the salati wanusuki wamamaya wamamati lillahi rabbil alayn alayn now 
إن الصلاة ونسك وما هي وما ماتي لله رب العالمين لا شريك له Everything is for Allah When you do that Then Allah will bring about the change When you don't do that You're always like Oh what do I get out of this What's that for me Then Allah will not bring the change Because people are not sincere People are not sincere So Musab was preaching And mashallah um, You know he was sacrificing His life, his family uh, He was teaching the Quran Reciting the Quran And it was just very very great outcomes Musa returned to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca a little before the program season and informed him that there is a great reception given to Islam in Yathrib he told him of the large number who had entered Islam and basically uh, they would come to see him now people say like why did they have to wait a year well they waited a year because um, it was not like again they didn't have communication ways they didn't have modes of communications uh, that um, they, they just did it you know so it was it was difficult so they waited one hour and I mean they waited one year and then finally the next uh, the next um, the next year they went to the process and then during the Hajj and um, um, you know, they, 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 they basically pledged the second, the second pledge of allegiance. So Musa went to prepare the, the, uh, you know, the item or the, in the itinerary for this meeting. So the second pledge of Aqaba, and this is a greater number now, and Alhamdulillah, this was a great, a great indication that the Prophet was now to be going to Medina. I think it was the first one was not enough. Uh, the second one was the one that really, really uh, made a difference. Right? That was uh, the one that really made a difference. Now, so they all came um, to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ja'bar ibn Abdullah reported that 70 men from amongst us traveled to meet him in the pilgrimage season. 70 men. Okay, and we promised to meet him at Aqaba, and so we arrived there in uh, ones, twos, they didn't come as one group. Why? Because there's still travelers on the way, and they could have told uh, the Quraysh, and it could have been a battle, so they are smart about it. So they came, and they said, Ya Messenger of Allah, what shall we pledge with you? He replied, this is very important. He said, you shall pledge, pledge to hear and obey me in times of activity and inactivity. To spend in ease and hardship, to enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong. To stand up for Allah's sake without fear of any reproach. To aid and protect me when I come to you. From all that which you protect your own selves, your wives, your children, and in return you will have Jannah. Look at that. Simple. Give me everything you have. Me? Am I going to benefit from it? No, it's not for me. It's for the taqwa. It's for what you are going to get. The world. Me and you are Muslims today because of this, because of this pledge, because of these people supporting Prophet ﷺ. Can't you see it? You and I are Muslims today because the Prophet ﷺ was supported by these people from Yathrib. Of course, by Allah, and Allah's uh, you know, uh, permission. But what was the trade? What was the... We give you everything. Our money, yes, money. Because you cannot go without money, man. You don't pay the rent, you're going to get your center. You don't pay the bills, you're going to be able to do something. Your shop, your whatever it is. No. You need money. Money. It's just the way it is. I don't know why people get so, you know, so, so sensitive when it comes to daqwa and money. Christians don't get sensitive. They have a lot. And they invest a lot. So... 
the Prophet said, give me, and not me, because the Prophet didn't take any of that. But for the dakwah, I guarantee you Jannah. I guarantee you Jannah. So we stood up for him, okay, and uh, Asad ibn Zurah, Zurara, who was the youngest of the 70 after me, took his hand and said, slowly people of Yathrib, we did not travel to him without knowing that he is the messenger of Allah. And to accept him now is a challenge to all the Arabs. It is the killing of your best and clashing with your swords. So either you understand that and accept it, and then your reward will be with Allah. Or else you are afraid for your lives, so admit that plainly, and it will be your excuse before Allah. SubhanAllah. I mean, that is, this is the youngest man among all of them. Compare that to our kids today and our youth. Okay? This is someone who's speaking. He says, okay guys, take it easy. You can either be ready to sacrifice and know that you will lose, or, yeah, just admit that you're scared, you're a coward. Maybe Allah will forgive you. And this is what a young man would think like back in the days, mashallah. They said, Asad, take your hand away. By Allah, we shall not abandon this pledge, nor shall we retire. So we stood one by one and took the pledge with him. So they would basically shake. And I pledge allegiance. Bayah, it's called Bayah. I pledge it. Ka'b ibn Malik reported, we slept that night, the night of Aqaba, with our people in our camp. When a third of the night had passed, we left the camp for the rendezvous with the Prophet ﷺ, slipping away like cats and hiding until we were all assembled in the valley near Aqaba. We were 73 men, and with us were two of our women. Okay, Nasiba bin Ka'b and Asma bin Amr ibn Adi. Nasiba. So there's two women as well. 73 men and two women came to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to take pledge of allegiance. We assembled and waited for Prophet and came accompanied by Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib who is Abbas. He is one of the uncles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who was still a pagan. Look at that. He was not a Muslim. He was still a pagan at that time. But he had allegiance to the family. He had honor. That is one of the great traits of the Quraysh before Islam that they had this issue of honor and family. So he wanted to be present with his nephew and vouch for his integrity that this guy is not lying. I don't believe maybe in him at this point, but he's not like trying to get something. So, when he sat down, he was the first to speak as he's an elder. He said, Oh, people of Yatre, Muhammad's status amongst us, as you know, is very known. Okay, we have protected him from our people who hold the same opinion about him as we do. He is thus respected among his people and protected this country. Now he insists on aligning with you and going over to you. So he look, Abbas saying, don't worry, like he's still protected with us, which is true, but not really, because they were trying to kill the Prophet. Okay, they were trying to kill the Prophet. But he says, look, now he insists to go with you. If you think that you will be able to fulfill your promise to him and protect him from whoever opposes him, then that is your responsibility. But if you think you are not, you're going to betray him and withdraw your support after he has gone over to you, then leave him alone from now on, for he is safe in his country. It was an issue of embarrassment also for the family of the Prophet ﷺ, that his tribe is after him, trying to kill him. So he's, Abbas is trying to say, look, we will protect him. But you never know. Kaab continued. 
And we said to him, we have heard what you said, so speak, O Messenger of Allah, and decide for yourself and your Lord whatever you like. Prophet ﷺ spoke and recited from the Qur'an. Call to Allah and invite this to Islam, Allah. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't say, oh yeah, I think it's a good idea. No, he recited Qur'an. Okay? And then he said, I take your pledge that you will protect me from that which you protect your women and children from. Allah Akbar. Then Al-Bara ibn Ma'arur took him by the hand and said, Yes, by him who sent you with the truth, we shall protect you from that which we protect our families from. We have made a pledge to you, O Messenger of Allah, and by Allah we are sons of war, having inherited from our fathers and grandfathers. Allah Akbar. Bravery, chivalry, strength. Abu Haytham ibn al Tahan then interjected and said, O Messenger of Allah, we have treaties with the Jews and we're going to annul them. Is it possible that if we do so and that Allah grants us victory, that perhaps you return to your people and leave us? So he says, okay, we have some treaties with these people. But let's say Allah gives you victory in Islam. Then you can just go back to your people. You can just leave us, abandon us. The Prophet ﷺ smiled and said, no, blood is blood and destruction is destruction. I am one of you and you of me. I fight whom you fight and take peace with whom you take peace. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ asked them to select 12 chiefs, naqibs, from amongst themselves. And they chose nine from the Khazraj and three from Al Aws. And he said to them, You are the guardians of your people, just as the disciples were the guardians on behalf of Jesus, son of Mary. And I am a guardian over my people. SubhanAllah. That was the Pledge of Aqaba with the agreements that were concluded and the discussion took place. Surely the spirit of certainty, sacrifice, and daring reigned over this gathering and infiltrated every word that was uttered. And it was clear that there was emotions, there was a lot of, you know, it was something very difficult for every part, but this was the greatest challenge now and probably the greatest change for the victory of Islam to come. Right? So what were the gains or what would the pledge do? Basically, the whole affair was basically um, that these people are going to help the Prophet that the Prophet is going to come to Medina, that he will solve their problems, that he will be their leaders, that he will remove the war that happened, that he will rectify the condition of the Arabs versus the Jews. Right? There's a lot that was happening. And now it's time to move from Mecca to Medina. Almost half of the Quran was revealed in Mecca. And it followed the Hufad who memorized it. It was recorded on the scrolls by the scribes. And this was the portion that was revealed in Mecca. Okay, talked about Aqidah, about paradise, about everything. Now, it talked about everything. The Quran also recounted the history of the early believers, so they knew, um, you know, how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saved them. And 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 so these were some of the themes of the Quran. So now, Abdul Malik al Ashari reported the Prophet Sallallahu said, "O people, hear and understand, and know that Allah has servants who are neither prophets nor martyrs." But the prophets and the martyrs envy them for their high status and their closeness to Allah. Look at that. So a Bedouin said, O Messenger of Allah, a group of people, neither prophets nor martyrs, but envied by the prophets and martyrs for their status and closeness to Allah, describe them to us. Look at how they're so keen to learn. He says, there are people from far off tribes who are not connected by any close blood relationship, love one another and have bonded themselves into one rank for Allah's pleasure. On the day of judgment, Allah will erect 
pulpits of light for them and they will, visit, they will sit on them. He will make their faces and their clothes shine. The people on the day of judgment will be frightened, but not they. They are friends of Allah upon whom no fear shall come, nor shall they grieve. So this is a beautiful description of people, tribes far off, who are not connected by any close blood relations. Who? Who could this be? Yeah, subhanAllah, us, you. Tribes far off. Where is Mecca? Where is Malaysia? Where is other places? Converts, reverts, Chinese, Indians, whoever they are. These are the people. What unites you and I? We are not from the same tribe. I'm not from your nationality. You're not from mine. It is not nationalism. It is Islam. It is the deen that unites us. We have no blood relationships. But we love one another for the sake of Allah. Faith in Allah and love for His pleasure, brotherhood in His religion and mutual support in His name. All of this was basically going through the minds of the people. This is what the Prophet was bringing to Medina. This is what the Prophet now. One of the idolaters was walking among the pilgrims' tents and on hearing the noise coming from an Aqaba close by, he was able to guess what was happening. He shouted a warning to the people of Mecca, Muhammad and his converts have gathered together to wage war on you. His voice was loud enough to wake the sleepers. The Muslims realized that their plans had been uncovered, but they showed no concern for the consequences. So Subhanallah, I see it was dangerous, but they still did it. So uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubada said, O Messenger of Allah, by him who is sent with the truth, if you wish, we shall attack the people of Mina tomorrow with our swords. However, the Prophet said, we are not ordered to do that. Return to your camps. Ka'ab continues report saying, when the morning came, some of the leaders of the Quraysh approached our camp and said, O assembly of Khazraj, we were informed that you have come to our men to take him away from our presence and you have pledged with him to wage war on us. By God, there is no Arab settlement with which we should hate to be at war more than with yourselves. At this, some of the islanders amongst us got up and swore that there was nothing of that sort and that they had no knowledge of it, such a thing. And they were right. They had no knowledge of it because they didn't participate. Kaab added, we exchanged glass glances with one another. However, circumstances proved the rumor to be true. And so Quraysh went after the people of Medina, but were unable to catch up with them. The only one they caught up was Sa'ad ibn Ubada, and they brought him back to Mecca in chains, dragging him by the hair and kicking him. However, Jubair ibn Mutim and Haris ibn Harb rescued him from there, since Sa'ad always used to extend to them his protection in Medina. Right? So they reciprocated. Now, Okay, the beginning of Hijrah. Let's stop here. Let's stop here because that is uh, another big topic that we start. The beginning of the Hijrah. Page 176. Now, okay, any questions? Any questions? Page 176, the beginning of the Hijrah of the Prophet. Now, Any questions? Barakallahu feekum. Beautiful lessons from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu You can see the sacrifice that these people did for the Prophet Sallallahu For what? I mean, they were not related to him. They had no investment, nothing. But it was for the sake of truth. It was for the sake of, of truth. Now, so that's something that we learn for ourselves. Sometimes we have to stand even with the people that we don't have blood relations with. But we are connected by faith and truth, inshallah. By faith and truth. Now, 
Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum Allah khair. May Allah bless all of you. Inshallah, see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.